Stay awake in vain. And I, I'm reading these scriptures against the backdrop of the tragic events of last week. And I wanted to serve as a moment of introspection, both individually and nationally. And when I saw what happened last week, it was shocking but not surprising. When I say it's shocking but not surprising, uh, when you understand the dynamics of what's happening in the country over a period of time, you begin to realize that some of these things are inevitable unless changes happen. Essentially, what happened last week is the result of something I call the game. The game has been with us forever. Way back in the day, I understood the game because I was in the game. And what happened is that the players changed and tactics changed, but it's the same game. And, you know, sometimes people look at young people with guns and they say, well, you know, why are these people having guns? But when you're in the game, a gun is not an accessory, it's an essential item. And unless a man's heart is changed, um, he's going to default to what he needs to conduct his business or protect himself. So in that way, it's not surprising. What I also realized from being on both sides is that we are suffering currently from a cultural phenomenon. We started out where these things were free, but over time, and, and because I've been around and I'm still involved in a lot of things and know a lot of things, uh, the truth of the matter is we are suffering from a cultural phenomenon, something that has become a part of our culture. Young men growing up, they are graduating into that culture, and it's, it's, it's something that we have to be aware of. And one of the things that I realized um, from back in the day, you know, I, I personally worked with a lot of gang members. I mean, when I returned home from school, one of the first things that I did when I returned home from college is I went into local schools and I said to the principal, the guidance counselor, I said, give me all of the gang members. And I sat down, worked with those guys, and a number of them today are pastors, businessmen, leaders. But what I noticed in the process is that we have a systemic issue. You know, several of the guys that I work with, one guy, uh, he didn't know who his father was. was a, a gang leader. And uh, he, he, when he shared with me his story, it was just a lot. It was just me and my brother and my, and my parents. My parents were Haitian. And they just left and went to Miami, never said a word, never looked back. And so these guys were left on their own. So we have a, a cultural issue. And the thing about it is that there's nothing, no magic wand where we could say we're going to do this and solve it. So we can't say, well, you know, let's get all the guns off of the streets and everything is, is solved. The truth of the matter is that if it's not collective, it won't be effective. When I say collective, if all of us don't look inside and say, what can we do? How can we play a part? If we don't look at it from that perspective, then, you know, I can't have a great expectation of any change. And it's, it's not going to be easy. But there are things that are possible because I've seen the results. I could give you a long list of names and addresses of young men, you know, who, who've been able to make a turnaround because someone intervened. And so I think we have to refocus on things that build lives. Whether it's community, whether it's church, whether it's sport, whatever it is, we have to look at this moment and say, what can we do? What can I do? 
that sometimes we tend to look and say, what can they do? Not what can I do? But we have to look in the mirror and say, what am I doing? If you are not going, are you supporting those who go? Or are you giving lip service? You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, that's great. I remember, you know, when I was working with gang members, uh, you know, people would come to me, man, it's a great job. And they never offer, uh, they never say, well, is the program need funding? They just say, great. And they don't realize that, you know, I'm risking my life. You know, there are times when I mediated situations, you know, where people have done and, and, and contemplating action. And there I am in the middle. I mean, I, some situations just incredible. But I think we have to make sure that we all look inside. And when we see things like this happen, it becomes a seminal moment. We say, you know, I am going to do something. We are going to do something. And every avenue is necessary. You know, the police have to do their work. Uh, the community has to do their work. The church has to do their work. And you can't point a finger at one group and say, well, y'all ain't doing it. We're doing it. The truth of the matter is that everyone is falling down if this is our situation. So everyone has to stand up. So I just want to encourage you today to remember that it's hard, but it's possible. I want to close with a, a story, and I, I, some of you may have heard this story before, but there were these two young men on, on the beach in California and they were walking along the shore, and as they walked along the shore, they saw that the tide has re had receded, and it had left thousands and thousands and thousands of starfish. And the starfish couldn't get back in the water. And as they were walking, one guy said to the other, he said, man, this is a tragedy, you know. So they're gonna die. And he said, well, there's, and there's nothing that we can do. You know, uh, It's too many of them. So the second guy, he walked up to one of the starfish and he said, you know what, this one isn't going to die. And he went, threw it in the water. Then he picked up another one and he said, this one isn't going to die either. And I think that's how we have to look at it. You know, we have to save who we can and realize that you know, some people are not going to make it, but um, there, is, there are things within our power that we can do. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads together. Father God, we just thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for our country. We know the challenges that we face, but we know that we've been given talents, gifts, abilities. Father, help us all to be introspective today and determine what we will do to save the topic. We thank you for the deliberations today and we pray that everything as usual would be done in decency and in order as an example to our nation and we pray that our proceedings would have a favorable outcome in jesus name Amen. our father in heaven all of you thank you our kingdom come our will be done on earth as it is in heaven we hope to say our daily bread and give us our heart as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Jeff Simonet, Jeff Bannister, Brenda Bell, Jeff Boyd, Dr. Greenspan, Martin Green, Francis Campbell, Nico Diagna, Michael Pintard, Sarah Penfield, Ramal Ferrara, Anusha Roll, Brenzel Roll, Ellsworth Johnson, Philip Davis, Vaughn Miller, Patricia Parker Edson, Aaron Lewis, Carlton Bolag, James Aubrey, Travis Robinson, Adrian Gibson, Ronald Saunders, Frederick McElpine, Hank Johnson, Mark Hume, Michael Pope, Miriam Repley Manuel, Lee Shipman, Ruben Ramey, Ricky Mackey, Sandon Cartwright, Chanel Ferguson, 
Lennis Hannah Martin, Fight Row 4, Chester Peace. Good morning, honorable members. Honorable members, just a brief report from uh, a working group meeting that was attended by a delegation from the Bahamas. It was a virtual meeting by the Pal Americas on Monday, uh, dealing with openness in Parliament. The Speaker, the President of the Senate and the Vice President of the Senate uh, represented the, the Bahamas at that meeting and, and that meeting was attended by the speakers from a number of countries including Belize, Jamaica, Antigua, the Bahamas, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, uh, Canada, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and Trinidad and Tobago. The major focus of the meeting was uh, openness in the legislative branches of government, transparency, accountability, oversight, citizen participation, openness and freedom of information, gender equality, and the social media impact on the legislative branch of government. And honorable members, I have a further invitation from Paul Americas for another meeting on the 7th of, of May for those persons who may be interested in attending in an observer status. Uh, you can notify the clerk and, pres and present the clerk with your emails so that he can supply those emails to the organizers. That meeting is Friday, May 7th, beginning at 10 a.m. And that meeting will be dealing with access to public information for the Parliament of the Americas and the Caribbean. Introduction and swearing-in of new members. Laying of documents by ministers. I recognize the Honorable Member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I beg leave to be on the table of the House a copy of the following mm -hmm. Emergency Powers COVID 19 Pandemic Risk Management Number 4 Amendment and 11 Order 2021. Um, order that the document be brought up. the document to lie on the table for the laying of documents by ministers. Speaker, speak I beg leave lay on the table of the House copy of the following. The Bahamas Register Stock Directions 2020 Bahamas Register Stock Number 15, 2023, 2025, 2027, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Order that the document be brought up. that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair Begley, lay on the table of the House a copy of the following. The Bahamas Registered Stock Direction 2021, Bahamas Registered Stock Number 2, 2024, 2026, 2028, 2041, and 2051. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House a copy of the following. The Bahamas Registered Stock Direction 2021, Bahamas Registered Stock Number 3, 2024, 2026, 
2021 and 2051. How did the documents be brought up? How did the document do lie on the table? Further laying up documents by minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House a copy of the following. The Bahamas registered stock directions. 2021 Bahamas registered stocks 2022. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The member for Yamaka would be late because he's engaged in speaking engagement and therefore I would lay document for him. I beg leave to lay on the table of house a copy of the following. The industrial encouragement approved product Blue Terra Limited Order 2021. Order that the document be brought up. That the document do lie on the table. Where the laying of documents? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to lay on the table of the House a copy of the following: the Industries Encouragement Approved Manufacturer Blue Terra Limited Order 2021. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. To recognize the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I beg you to lay on the table of the House copy of the following. The Price Control General Amendment Number 4, Regulations 2021. Order that the document be brought up. That the document will lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Mount Mariah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House a copy of the following: The Royal Bahamas Police Force Commission's Policing Plan 2021. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for North Abaco. Mr. Speaker, in proxy the Minister of Tourism, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House. Copy of the following. A. The Airport Authority audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2015. And B. The Airport Authority audited financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2016. Order that the documents be brought up. on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. Do you recognize this honorable member for Bamboo Town? Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are no further laying of documents. Um, Mr. Clark, I, I wish to lay on the table the invitation from Parliament Americas for the 7th of May, uh, inviting members to participate in their webinar on access to public information for Parliament of the Americas and the Caribbean. Order that the document do lie on the table.
statements and communications by ministers. If you recognize this honorable member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I start, in medicine, a simple rule of thumb that has always prevailed is that you cannot just treat symptoms. You must try to find cause and treat the cause. Because if you do not treat the cause, you would repeatedly be treat, treating symptoms. The speaker, I go through my communication. I think we have identified the cause. But we cannot continue to treat symptoms. So I can only say that in identifying the cause, enforcement must be increased and enforcement must be done and the orders that were placed must be adhered to once these are done Mr. Speaker then we would be able to conquer the disease Mr. Speaker the government of the Bahamas has continued to carefully monitor the health data of the COVID-19 pandemic. And yesterday, Dr. Merslin Dahl Regis, Special Health Advisor to the Prime Minister and Chair of the National COVID-19 Vaccine Consultative Committee and other medical officials gave a press conference and presentation on the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic here in the Bahamas. And Dr. Dahl Regis is one of the leading experts in the Americas in her field. She is internationally recognized for many decades of service and work in public health. The Bahamas is most fortunate, Mr. Speaker, to have such an expert expertise, to have her expertise and guidance here with us. The government and the Bahamian people are pleased to have her wise counsel. I commend her remarks, Mr. Speaker, and the data she offered to the nation. It is most unfortunate that some individuals seem not to understand or appreciate the medical science and data. It is, I, it is quite possible that after, year, after yesterday's press conference, that some may once again publicly ask for the very science and data that the medical officials just put out in detail including through various slides and graphs. Some individuals, Mr. Speaker, have the odd habit of asking, where's the science? Right after the medical experts present the science to the whole country. And throughout the pandemic, we have carried the briefings of the science by the medical team on TV and via social media. The data on cases is sent out daily. The data and information are made public, Mr. Speaker, for all to see. And Mr. Speaker, I wish to recall a number of critical areas from yesterday's presentation. As Dal we just noted that, quote, we are in a race against time and that the pandemic is not over. COVID-19 is contagious.
continuously presenting new challenges. At this time, vaccinations alone will not get us out of this pandemic. We must simultaneously address the increase in cases, the identification of resistant strains, and adhere to the public health measures if we are to win this race and return to a sense of normalcy. But we just further went on as we seek to increase access to COVID-19 vaccine and the number of vaccinations administered, we have also been observing an increase in some numbers on a daily basis over the last two weeks. New infections are being driven by international travel and a relaxed adherence to the health measures. Speak, I want to repeat that. New infections are being driven by international travel and a relaxed adherence to the health measures. The emergence of variant strains of COVID-19 is of significant concern. New strains have been identified from the United Kingdom, Brazil, South Africa, and most recently, India. And these variants spread more easily and are infecting younger age groups the cases may be more severe. End quote. Mr. Speaker, our region of the Americas is having particular difficulty. An active emergency exists in South America with numerous countries battling extreme conditions. There are surges in the Caribbean and increased cases and hospitalizations in parts of North America. Beyond the Americas, in, Euro in Europe, numerous countries are still under heavy, heavy restrictions. Some are battling variant-driven upswings that began months ago. And new surges are also occurring in some parts of Southeast East Asia. The broad global uptick and increase in cases is affecting the Bahamas. Analysis, Mr. Speaker, is on is underway to give us more information as to their role in our current circumstances. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Dalry just reported, quote, we have been actively monitoring genomic testing from the 13th of March to the 17th of April. The results are reported by the National Reference Lab, are showing evidence of an increasing number of genomic deletions, and this is indicative of variant strains. She noted that we must return to heightened surveillance and contact tracing if we are going to win this race in the shortest period of time and that we have to accelerate the uptake in vaccines. To help control the surge in new cases, we must test, we must isolate, we must treat, treat, trace, treat, and vaccinate. All cases and contacts of cases must be identified to bring the spread of COVID-19 under control. And as part of the contact tracing process, private lab reporting requirements are also being enforced to ensure that information reaches health officials in a complete, accurate, timely manner. Then on to say at the same time we are moving to accelerate 
the vaccination program throughout the Bahamas. You see, I want the Bahamas to realize that we are truly in a race to the finish line with this virus. And whoever reaches the finish line first is victorious. And I try to put it in simple language, Mr. Speaker. That is, the virus and the vaccine, us, and a 100 meter race, the virus is occupying lane number three, and the vaccine is occupying lane number four. The government will do all it can to obtain the vaccine, the government will do all it can to ensure proper rollout, implementation, and access to the vaccine by its populace. That's lane number four. The vaccine, so the government will continue to push the vaccine to and the people to the finish line ahead of the virus in lane number three. But the government does not control lane number three, Mr. Speaker. The people control lane number three. It's our behavior. The partying, our breaking of laws and orders, our disregard for curfews, our breaking of orders on beaches, etc. These type of behavior, Mr. Speaker, will facilitate the vaccine, the, the virus in lane number three to reach the finish line before we do the vaccine. So, Mr. Speaker, it is essential for the people to make sacrifices and slow down the virus in lane number two. Our sacrifice can lead to greater prosperity and a better outcome and a better Bahamas tomorrow. As you read throughout world literature, the Bahamas is considered the most favored destination at this time. We are ready to take off, but we must adhere to regulations. Just recently, the U.S. Travel Advisory has put place us level number four, along with 80 percent, along with 80 percent of the world of 140 countries. We stay in that road before, Mr. Speaker, and we have overcome. We know what to do, we have done it, and we will do it again. But I want people to realize that the Bahamas is not just New Providence. We are an archipelago of nations. Jamaica is one island, Barbados is one island, Grenada is one island. We are an archipelago of nations. If you look at Inagua, a COVID-19 infection, is zero. You look at Auckland, zero. Crooked Island, zero. Long Key, zero. Long Island, zero. Andres, occasionally one. Cat Island, zero. San Salvador, zero. Rum Key, zero. Mr. Speaker, our problem are confined basically to New Providence and Grand Bahamas. So I say, let us win this race, lane four, so that we can prepare for our independence ceremony 
and we can likewise prepare for the greatest cultural event that is held here in the Bahamas at John Canoe Christmas time. The speaker, I said all that so that the world would recognize that as an archipelago of nation, most of our islands are not affected with COVID. Mr. Speaker, I met the representative, I met with representatives of the testing laboratories yesterday morning. And I reminded them of the requirement to submit COVID-19 test results to the Ministry of Health surveillance team. I also reminded them, Mr. Speaker, of the fine penalty for not submitting the test results as required. I reminded them that the fine for such an event was $20,000. The requirement to submit data will be tightened for the RT-PCR test results being submitted within 24 hours. There will be stiff, stiffer penalties for the failure to abide by this requirement. And I had informed the lab as to what those penalties Speaker, at this time, I would not inform the nation as to those penalties. However, the labs are well aware of the extent of the penalties should they not report test results to the appropriate authorities so that they could be managed appropriately within 24 hours. This is a part of our heightened surveillance strategy to combat the increase in cases. Mr. Speaker, I also note that the enforcement of emergency orders will also be increased and enhanced. Members of the public are asked to please comply. I'm asking businesses that are able to do so to have their employees work from home where possible to decrease the spread of COVID-19. And I note, Mr. Speaker, that this is a voluntary request. Mr. Speaker, I wish to know the number of additional measures we are taking. Effective, we have been monitoring Abaco and have analyzed the data on the situation in Abaco. Effective immediately. The daily curfew on mainland Abaco will be removed from 8 a.m. 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. and replaced by 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. travelers within the Bahamas who have been fully vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus will be exempted from COVID-19 test requirements that are currently in place when traveling in New Providence, Grand Bahama, Abaco, Exuma, and Utrecht. These travelers, Mr. Speaker, will be exempted immediately after full vaccination. The speaker, what we're saying, what I'm saying, is that once individuals within our shores, all of us, as well as those coming to visit, once they have received the second dose vaccine or they have met the vaccination requirements they do not need any further testing 
to move about through our Bahama land. Therefore, I encourage individuals to receive the vaccine as quickly as possible. I am aware of CDC's regulations, Mr. Speaker. CDC states that there must be a two weeks delay post the second vaccination shot. However, within the Bahamas, we recognize the amount of the antibody level and the immunity. And therefore, that two week requirement is not necessary. Once we receive the second dose, we can move to Lutra, any island, any province, any island, from Bahamas, any island, without any additional form of testing. And you can move about. However, you must still adhere to the mitigation protocols in terms of social distancing, mask wearing, sanitization, etc. Effective. The 1st of May, this is important for tourism, so as to give them adequate time to put out their necessary warning and alert. Effective the 1st of May, those traveling to the Bahamas from outside of the country will be exempted from a COVID-19 test if they are fully vaccinated and have passed the two-week immunity period. And proof of full vaccination will be required. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, if an individual is not fully vaccinated, that individual will still be required to provide a COVID negative COVID-19 tests, their testing requirements are in place. The speaker, this would greatly assist our economy and it would also assist in reducing the number of infections. <coughs> Once individuals are fully vaccinated, individuals can participate in a closed environment, once all within the closed environment are fully vaccinated, then the mask would not be necessary and they can participate within that environment. That is once all are vaccinated. Speaker, that means that indoor dining can resume for those individuals who are completely vaccinated. It also means, Mr. Speaker, from a cultural perspective, that those like myself who participate in Junkanoo once we are all vaccinated, we can work within the Junkanoo shops among us all vaccinated individuals. Ms. Speaker, this is important because it allows within an enclosed restaurant or wedding facility once all are vaccinated, it also means that the cultural events that we had yesterday, where individuals within restaurants and weddings would have junk canoe rushing through the environment, that can occur once all, including the junk canoers, are vaccinated. And therefore, we can commence some form of normal life. 
But Mr. Speaker, most important as we move forward, enforcement must be our head to. And I recognize excellent work the police and COVID ambassadors were doing. And I recognize that many of them are probably burnt out. But I ask them to just provide us with that extra burst of energy for the next two weeks so that we can enforce our laws, our orders, especially <coughs> with all the events that are occurring around our island. Mr. Speaker, my government has been working day and night to get vaccines to the Bahamas. And thus far, we have received 20,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine as a gift from the government of India along with 33,600 from the COVAX facility. The Pan-American Health Organization has informed the Bahamas that we will receive the second tranche of AstraZeneca vaccine through the COVAX facility before the end of May. And this tranche will consist of 33,000 doses. That leaves the remaining 34,200 doses to be received from the COVAX facility. Thus far, we have administered approximately 22,000 doses of the vaccine. The vaccines are being administered on the islands of New Providence, Grand Bahama, Lutra, and Abaco. Dr. Dal Regis yesterday set out the COVID-19 vaccine consultative committee schedule for the expansion of vaccinations across our island chain. Health and logistic teams were deployed yesterday to start reconnaissance visits in preparation for the start of vaccinations on the islands during the week of April 26th. And health team will be supported by local government officials, health administrators, and community leaders. The team will prepare vaccination sites, secure necessary supplies, and conduct training for online platforms. As Dr. Dahl Regis added, this is ambitious, but we hope it will be completed essentially over a several day period. In our family islands, we speak, the vaccine will be administered to all residents 18 years and older with a Bahamas government issued ID. And the proposed schedule announced yesterday is as follows. Monday, April 26th, Andres, Meguana, Inagua, Crooked Island, Acklands, Long Key, North, Central and South Andres, Ragged Island, and Mainland of Zuma. Tuesday, 27th of April, Ferry Islands, Great Harbor Key, Cat Island, San Salvador, and Long Island, of Zuma Keys, and Rum Keys. On Wednesday, April 28th, North, Central, and South Elutra, and Friday, April 30th, Plymouth. The location of vaccination sites and the days and times for each island will be published on opm.gov.es. That information will be widely circulated via other platforms. The family island locations will have online and on-site appointments. We encourage family islanders to make their appointments online at vax.gov.bs. Those who need help with ask a family member or a friend for assistance. Vaccinations, Mr. Speaker, 
are key to us getting out of this pandemic. In order to get back to normal, in order for our economy to fully open, open up, we need each Bahamian and resident to come forward, to be vaccinated, then eligible. Vaccines will help to prevent more sickness and death. We need our people to come forward quickly. Israel, Mr. Speaker, is the world's leader in vaccination. Their good work has led to a remarkable drop in cases. Their country is now responsibly and gradually opening up. If we get a large number of Bahamians vaccinated, we too could put the emergency phase of the pandemic behind us. I ask the Bahamians to get their vaccination when it is their time and to encourage friends and family to do the same. Once the family islands are completed, our full resources will be concentrated on new problems. The speaker, that is important. I know that there have been many complaining about helping to have PCR tests done. In some cases, at astronomical cost. But irrespective of PCR done. The speaker, that was necessary to prevent infection spreading to our family island. I spend a lot of time, Mr. Speaker, reading war books, how you fight war and battles. And one thing I've learned, which is, was common among all the authors, and we are at war. We are at war with the COVID virus. But what I've learned among all the authors is that in order to win a battle, you should try to concentrate your army and your resources in one battle first. If you find yourself in six, seven different battle fronts, you will lose the war. And that was why, Mr. Speaker, we ensured that we protected our family islands. It was essential that the spread of the virus did not extend into our family islands because we would have found ourselves fighting seven or eight battlefronts and we would have lost the war. We would have been in a worse situation than we are today. Had that happened, Mrs. Peters, just to give an example, just to transport a patient from the family island, she had a new problem, <clears throat> excluding the Air Force, just the port to transport those individuals, $10,000, one week to when you add up all the other costs and amenities, the transport one will run you as high as twenty-five thousand dollars. Can you imagine if we had not aggressively protect our family island to have numbers of individuals coming in being transported to the problem, the cost in addition to that feature? Many of our family islanders are elderly. We would have had a high death rate. And the speaker, I know it may have been hard in terms of what you quiet, but it was essential to protect the family islands. And the speaker, I urge them as the vaccine are introduced into their respective islands. I urge them to participate so as we can continue 
to protect our citizens within the front yard. Mr. Speaker, the measures I announced are only part of our necessary collective response. We are one Bahamian team in this fight. To address the increase in cases, we need every Bahamian and resident to fully practice all the public health measures. Throughout this pandemic, my government and I have crafted policy with our public health experts. We have worked to save lives and livelihoods. We only tighten restrictions via the emergency powers when it is necessary. When conditions improve, we loosen them. If we did not have the emergency powers, there would be chaos, more sickness, and more death. Those who oppose the emergency orders have taken a historically reckless position. In addressing this pandemic, we also use an island-by-island -island approach. For example, measures needed in New Providence may not be needed on Crooked Island or Marijuana or Long Island. Speaker, I want to repeat again, the hard war, once we protect our family island, we can fight enemy where yeah, our ammunition is mostly stacked here in New Providence. We do not like imposing restrictions, Mr. Speaker. We know the pandemic has had a great impact on people's finances and mental state. We only do so when they are necessary and only for the time required. The speaker was also noted at yesterday's press conference. Ministry of Health officials and the consultative committee will continue to provide regular updates on the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. We encourage the public to use the Ministry of Health and Office of Prime Minister's official website, social media platforms, and credible news sources to keep up to date and properly informed about the COVID-19 vaccine. The speaker, as I end my communication, I wish to offer the advice words of Dr. Bell Regis to stress. I quote, we are making progress, but our work is far from over. To help slow the spread of COVID-19 vaccine, we must redouble our efforts. That is, to help slow the spread of COVID-19, we must redouble our efforts. This is no time to relax. We must continue practice the public health measures. We must continue to avoid large gatherings. We must abide by the emergency orders. Wear our masks properly over our nose and our mouth. Keep a distance of six feet from others when you are out. Wash or sanitize your hands regularly. And when you are eligible, get vaccinated. The sooner we get vaccinated, the sooner we can open our economy. The sooner we get vaccinated, the sooner we can get back to work. The speaker, these times require perseverance. These times require making decisions based on what is required to protect our people. We are trained, Mr. Speaker, as doctors to tell our patients the truth as well as 
to offer hope. This is what has guided me for 40 years as a doctor and what has guided me during the COVID-19 pandemic. The speaker, I will always be and remain a doctor. And as a medical doctor, I have continued to monitor the health data and the science. As Prime Minister, I continue to utilize such vital data in my government's decision-making process. And as I have said before, let us continue to do our part to defeat this pandemic. In this spirit, and I invite those who wish to volunteer to help in the vaccination program to do so. You may sign up to volunteer at COVAX at bahamas.gov.er. I repeat that, COVAX at bahamas.gov.er. Speaker, again, for us to conquer this virus, it's all about enforcement, enforcement, and trust. That's why I ask, again, and I told it in Pastor. No stretch of tired. But I ask the uh, energy over the next two weeks to be even increased further than before. So as we can do for us, for us, for us. I want you also to pay particular attention, especially to the areas around the Compass Point area, <laughs> where many residents continue to complain not only of noise pollution, but that hundreds and hundreds of people who are gathered outside their residence, preventing them from sleeping or any form of rest. The speaker. May God continue to bless and guide our Bahamas. Before I thank you and the Bahamian people, I only want to make, I only want to note and the nation to hear a clarification. A week ago in Parliament, I stated that homes in industrial gardens were being bought for 182,000 or more. When we came in government, we felt that those individuals were overpriced and were charged more than they should have. And therefore, individuals who, the last few homes that were left, individuals who were purchasing those homes, we had dropped the fee to $140,000, which we thought were reasonable. Remember, an individual whom I have great respect for and admiration. And he knows me, I would not like to lose that respect. He would not let me lose that respect. He would not let me. He's reporting to the people in Custer that I said we would reduce their fee or their purchase price from the 180 or 200 or 220,000 that they paid 140. I said no such thing. I said the people were overcharged. I asked them to be fair. But God said, don't make me an enemy. Thank you very much. May God bless the Congress of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the communication be brought up. I, I, really, um, I want those people to understand that their mortgage and their conveyance, I cannot change. They were overcharged by the previous government. I cannot change that. But I can correct moving forward. Thank you. No.
feeling yet. Uh, uh, honorable member for Kerr Island, um, we are speaking in communication by ministers. Yeah. This, as this model is, in my estimation, a model of life and death. I will permit questions, but I would prefer to do so after the member for Bambi Town. Who is the Minister of Health? I'll make this communication. Yes. Did you recognize this on the member for Bamboo Town? Mr. Speaker, as you know, it's the custom when giving ministers communication, we go in the order of our seniority and cabinet. So after PM speaks, I would have spoken and then the Minister for Social Services, but we're going to allow the Minister for Youth, Sports and Culture to speak, and then I will be up after him to speak because he, he has a travel, well, he has an engagement that he needs to meet. Thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the communication. Do lie on the table. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Central Grand Baham. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Government Leader, for allowing me to now make my presentation. Mr. Speaker, stand on the good graces of the people of Central Grand Bahama. And before I get into my minister's statement, with the indulgence, I would like to allow, um, offer three condolences to two individuals. And I'll start off with um, Deputy Prime Minister and the member for Carmichael and the recent loss of his father. Um, this is personal to me that I remember 12 years ago when I lost my father. The DPM was on vacation in the far land with his father at the time. And he sent me a note. He said, I know it must be rough you're going through, but I will be in Freeport sit with you and your family during the funeralization of your father to offer support even if it meant cutting his vacation short and like I said he was on vacation with his father at the time and through the form when he came to the Bahamas he jumped on the next plane to Freeport and sat with me and my family at the funeral and I'll say to you that was so powerful it went a long way in helping us to get forward so valid so I do appreciate that and I understand that you know, father was extremely close, but in my case, so I know you're going through a lot, and I want to offer the second goal to you and to your family during this trying time. I also would like to offer condolences to the family of Miss Elizabeth Lyon. Um, you know, her daughter, Kathy Lyon, is well known to all of us, and they'll be funeralizing her on May 1st. I'd also like to offer condolences to the family of Mabel Russell in Watercare close cousin of mine who died at 104 last week and she will be also funeralized on May 1st. Um, I also lost another cousin last night, Mr. Edmund Russell, um, this morning in fact. So I'm offering condolences to all of those families um, as they prepare to lay their loved ones to rest. Now let me get into the crux of my statement. I'm really here today. Uh, sorry, Mr. Speaker, I also would like to offer condolences to President of the Senate, Madam President, on the loss of her brother yesterday. So again, I want to also offer condolences uh, to her. Thank you. The Department of Sports, in collaboration with the National Sports Authority, have indeed been very busy. We have embarked on the transformative improvements to facilities on the family of islands. Grand Bahama, the home of perhaps a lot of the national, I won't say the majority of the nation's top elite athletes, has been the first to benefit in what is the first phase of the family island, yeah, a lot, improvement exercise. Mr. Speaker, for too long the sporting fans which frequented the, bah the Grand Bahama sports complex in support of either our elite or future stars have been forced to endure the uncomfortable rough concrete seating in the heat of the day the concrete was hot and in wet days the area would remain damp or wet and they have to of course sit in those areas no longer will this be the case as the first installation of proper seating at the track and field facility has now been completed and already mr speaker 
we have received numerous messages of appreciation for this initiative. These strategic improvements will support the commitment of the government to stage the next edition of the Bahamas Games in 2023, which will coincide with the Bahamas' 50th anniversary of independence. Of course, the planning of this national event its ultimate success. To support these plans, my ministry has secured the services of the game in the person of former Director of Sports, Mr. Martin Lundy, to serve as lead consultant. Mr. Speaker, our swimming athletes and community in Grand Bahama likewise have not been overlooked as we delivered a brand new set of state-of-the-art starting blocks to the YMCA and, I, and they are being installed as we speak. Undoubtedly, we will expect to continue to see more outstanding performances from our career and elite athletes from the facility. As we now have stated that, touch five. The timing system, we have touch five. As the swimmers touch that five, the time stops. So thank you to Mr. Mr. Arjunon Cargill and his team from the Aquatic Foundation, they have been instrumental in ensuring that these blocks uh, went to Grand Bahama for installation. The Bahamas is respected for its world-class status in the discipline of track and field. And over the years, multiple disciplines in the sporting arena. The mark of this country and its people will forever be engraved in the annals of world sports history as a small country that produces great people and does great things. Today, despite a setback caused by the dreaded COVID-19 pandemic, we are still moving forward, upward, onward, together. Mr. Speaker, in my remarks in this Honorable House on 24th of March, 2021, I took the opportunity to acknowledge and congratulate the outstanding accomplishments of some of our top performing elite and collegiate athletes. Among those mentioned included Abukonia, not Abuko, who stepped out, Wonder Boy, Stephen Gardner, and Akin descendant, Desrado Das Chisholm. I must again continue to mention these athletes for their outstanding performances in addition to adding a few more names. Stephen Gardner, when I last spoke, opened the season with his fastest 200 meter ever in the time of 2024. A world leading time and meet record at that time. Here we are just three weeks later and Gardner posts another world leading time of 44.71 seconds in the 400 event at the Tom Jones Memorial Limitation. Almost, imagine it's almost a second faster than the second place finisher. And I'm sure the leader of government business understands the distance and the separation one second in the race. And, thank you. And I can say at this pace, absolutely, at this pace, if Stephen Garner remains healthy, he appears to be unbeatable. So we're looking good for the Olympics um, to be happening the far later this year. In volleyball, Eugene Stewart, this Bahamian professional volleyball player has already made his presence known and impact felt. Playing as middle blocker for his Romanian Championship League team, Arcada Galactica, the top league in the country, assisted him in leading the team to winning the Romanian National Championship on the 16th of April, 2021. Let's speak some more about Jazzism. Just as I confidently, confidently predicted in my communication back on the 24th of March, Jazzism's performance demanded his selection for the starting position as second baseman for the Miami Marlins. And that's the position we've seen soon as he's performing even better than they expected. Since then, Bahamian Jazzism has just about become a household name. Jazz's performance has been nothing short of dynamic and exciting. Jazz has exhibited tremendous power and athleticism, stealing bases, scoring singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. Notably, on the 10th of April, Jazz blasted a home run into the upper deck 
up the arena of a 100 mile power fast ball, fast pitch. Stunning. And this is a Cy Young, a Cy Young award winning pitcher, Jacob DeGrom, and beating the New York Mets 3 0. Jazz now leads the Marlins team in hitting with a 0.324 hitting average. I will. Sure. Continue to watch this young man grow and shine. Another first, and this is important, another first in BMA history was watching Jazz Tism and former MLB player, who was a former track athlete too, and now a first base coach for the San Francisco Giants, Antoine Richardson, compete against each other. History. This will be the first time that a Bahamian player and the first Bahamian, the first Bahamian MLB coach, we have a, a coach now in the MLB. And the good thing is, they recognize history. They paid homage to American baseball legend Jackie Robinson on that day they wore number, 20, number 42 on their jersey. The same jersey, the same number that Jackie Robinson wore. And I can tell you, other baseball players are in the pipeline. Like um, Tanaris Thomas from Pelican Point, he's from Bahama. Tavares Young, also gone Bahamian. Ian Lewis, not my son. And of course, Lucy Sports. I'll speak briefly to track and field, Mr. Speaker. Devin Charlton, a hurdle sprinter at Purdue University, recently turned in a fast time of 12. 84 seconds in the 100 meter hurdle, equaling equaling the Olympic qualifying time and booking a ticket to Tokyo. In so doing, she joined another 100 meter hurdler, Adria Seymour, who also qualified earlier this season. These two athletes now comprise a growing list of now eight Olympic A, A qualifiers for the Bahamas. I wish that these I wish these ladies and all other Olympic qualifiers continued good health and preparation. Mr. Speaker, Kendrick Thompson, and this is important, I want us to really listen to this. Kendrick Thompson, a physical education major at the University of the Bahamas right here, set a new national record of 7,644 points in the decathlon event. And another Bahamian also competing in that event, in that event, broke the national record. This event, thank you. And this event is one which is not one of the most local, it's not popular, but it's the most grueling as these athletes have to endure 10 different events. These are, in my opinion, the world's greatest athletes. Absolutely. Further, Mr. Speaker, this demonstrates the strength of the athletic program in our own University of the Bahamas and should be a source of encouragement for more athletes. I'm encouraging you to consider joining the stay at home opportunity prior to going abroad. Mr. Speaker, even in golf, recently Cameron Riley, Grand Bahamian native and a graduate student, a soon to be graduate student of Florida A&M in mechanical engineering with Summa cum laude grade in mechanical engineering this coming weekend. Yes, Cameron, Cameron help his team win the, the MEAC Middle East Atlantic Conference Golf Championship only yesterday, April 20th, 2021, and is currently the number five ranked minority player in America by the African Professional Golf Association. John Quell Jones and a Russian club on Sunday. They repeated as the Euro League champion in Silver Turkey. Mr. Speaker, let me reiterate the Bahamas, we are a sports power then, now, and always will be. Best wishes to all of our athletes. Bahamas, sports strong. Bahamas, power strong. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. Order that the communication be brought up. Um, the Chair recognizes the Honorable, uh, Honorable Member for Anderson. We are going to do submit the question after all this. Yes,
And he's leaving. Okay. Yes. Sure, recognize yes. the Honorable Member Prime Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I wanted to ask the Honorable Member and thank him for his um, update on the fantastic performance of our great Bahamian athletes. But there is an athlete in Kenya. His name is O'Neill Williams. He lives, he's, an, he's from Anglesen. And long distance brother, national record holder. And he is seeking to qualify for the Olympics. He has one more opportunity. He, he tried in Turkey and he had an injury. He has one more opportunity and he is bemoaning. And I, I, he left a voice note and it broke my heart because he spent tremendous time in Kenya, away from his country, his home and his people to train for this. He is actually blazing a new trail because I don't think any Bahamian has really um, demonstrated this level of performance. And he, he's bemoaning that the, the, the support from the Bahamas government is little or non-existent. And I wanted to make a case for him because I think it would be a tragedy that he has one more opportunity to qualify and that he is not given the absolute fullest support by his country to make history on behalf of the Bahamian people. And I'm, I'm inviting you to look at that and to please support that athlete, O'Neill Williams. Thank, thank you very much. We, we, we have, we have taken note of that. And yes, there's another athlete. Central Sorry. Bahama. Sorry, yes, I, I am fully aware of, of O'Neill. And of course, you know, just put this here. I'm reviewing this file right now. And you see how yes, we can support him. And there's another athlete from Grand Bahama, Del De Roy Booth, who also has a similar request. So we are, we are, um, the direct, we are, we are well aware. Yes, yes. And, and we have, we have supported and we will continue to. Yes. Th th thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, or order that the communication will lie on the table. Further statements and communication by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I do offer my sincere condolences both to the Deputy Prime Minister on his lawn and the President of the Senate on her loss as well. Mr. Speaker, some of the things I'm going to say in this communication may seem repetitive after the Prime Minister, but I seek to bring the technical position from the Ministry of Health as has been asked of me by the Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, globally the COVID-19 pandemic has reached an all-time high. COVID-19 cases and deaths, Mr. Speaker, globally continue to surge. The world is now seeing the highest rate of infection. I want to say that again, Mr. Speaker. The world is now seeing the highest rate of infection. The Director General, Mr. Tedros, in a press conference on Friday, the 16th of April, 2021, reported that around the world, cases and deaths are continuing to increase at a worrying rate. In fact, he continued, globally, the number of new cases per week has nearly doubled over the past two months. This is approaching the highest rate of infection that we would have seen so far during the pandemic. Some countries, Mr. Speaker, that had previously avoided widespread transmission are now seeing steep increased infection, end quote. This, this picture, Mr. Speaker, is also true for the region of the Americas and even closer to home, CARICOM member states. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas is no exception. Our data clearly shows that we are experiencing an increase, another surge. We are noticing a pattern that was seen at the beginning of the second wave. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we saw how COVID-19 cases slowed down during the second wave at the end of October, beginning of November 2020. We maintain a steady state after that for some months. However, by the end of February, beginning of March, the picture changed. And in recent weeks, there has been a threefold increase in cases, which is almost 300% from that time now. Mr. Speaker, New Providence continues to be the epicenter and the greatest contributor to the total COVID-19 burden in country. Of the approximately 1,901 new cases reported 
from the beginning of 2021 to now. Of that number, 1,079 of these have been in the Provident. This translates, Mr. Speaker, to almost 60% of the new cases being allocated to that total from New Providence alone. Mr. Speaker, there has been a quieting, decreasing of new cases on islands such as Elutra, Abaco, and Grand Bahama compared to prior weeks. I want to say that again. Even though we have seen increases in cases in New Providence, there has been a decreasing of new cases on the islands such as Elutra, Abaco, and Grand Bahama compared to prior weeks. In Abaco, for example, 12.5 new cases on average each week was being reported for the last two months. Last week, Abaco reported one, one, one new case for the week. Mr. Speaker, this quieting decreasing is in part due to the special mission in these islands. From the 30th of March to the 1st of April, 2021, a health team was dispatched to Elutra to assess and intensify contact tracing activities there, with special emphasis on Harbor Island. Similarly, activity occurred on the islands of Abaco, and a team is currently in Grand Bahama. The team visiting Elutra completed the following task. They determined the number of COVID-19 positive cases, assessed whether there was a need for further widespread testing, evaluated the manpower on the ground to enforce policies and procedures, commenced the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccinations, and made recommendations for improvement in the ministry, which included the acquisition of additional staff to augment the existing staff complement on the island, and to encourage residents and visitors to adhere to the public health guidelines. The team also trained personnel on updated protocols for quarantine, quarantining and isolation, and assisted with contact tracing activities and enforcing quarantine and isolation measures on Harbor Island in particular. Mr. Speaker, several metrics are used for tracking progress on, COVID on the COVID-19 front, such as incident cases, COVID-19 hospitalization as a function of available COVID-19 beds, human resource capacity and death, to name a few. Hospitalization rates among active cases have increased in country as of ICU admissions. In the beginning of January, deaths were 171. From then to now, Mr. Speaker, there has been a 13.5% increase in COVID-19 deaths. Notably, from April 1st to the 10th, 2021, deaths remain constant at 189. We are all noticing that the COVID-19 deaths are slowly increasing. It's increasing due in part to the increase in new deaths, the result of COVID infection, but also due to the further reassessment of a number of deaths that were initially registered on our dashboard as under investigation. As a result, Mr. Speaker, deaths now stand today at 194. Mr. Speaker, the transmission rate and the positivity rate add further insights to our national understanding and epidemiological profile for COVID-19. The positivity rate, or how prevalent positive cases 
of the disease are when compared to the number of tests being done. Notwithstanding some existing limitations, the available data suggests an increase in the positivity rate for the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry strongly believes there to be an association between the uptick in ICU admission and the level of COVID-19 severity at presentation to our tertiary care institution. Further investigations will shed light on whether the severity at presentation is linked to SARS-CoV-2 variants, which currently genomic screening by the National Reference Lab now suggests are circulating in the Bahamian population. Mr. Speaker, the National Reference Lab is now using the PCR-based approach to screen for variants of concern. This approach is a proxy of genomic sequencing that permits rapid monitoring of the spread of variants of concern localized in a community. Although this technology enables the identification of a genomic mutation deletion and is strongly indicative, it does not permit us to specify whether the mutation is specific to the known variants of concern of which the Prime Minister would have mentioned earlier. Those variants of concern are the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, and now, most recently, the Indian variant. Our collaborations continue with laboratories outside of the Bahamas, our jurisdiction, such as CARFA, to specifically identify the variants of concern that are likely in circulation in the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, the testing materials for the in-country variant screening were provided to us by PAHO and received at the National Reference Laboratory a little over a week ago. We commend the forward thinking of the laboratory director, the daughter of the member for Engliston, Dr. Indira Martin. The NRL completed screening of some 120 COVID-19 positive samples collected from the 13th of March to the 17th of April, 2021. From the analysis of these 120 samples, the National Reference Lab was able to make the following conclusions. There has been a weekly steady increase in the percentage of samples carrying the characteristic mutation present in all three of the variants. In the week of the 13th to the 19th of March, 2021, approximately 20% of the COVID-19 positive samples screened contained the variant mutation. That's at the beginning of March. And during the most recent week, the analysis from the 11th to the 17th of April, last week, 2021, an alarming 80% of the sample screen, positive sample, contain the variant mutation. Mr. Speaker, this trend in the data indicates that one or more variants of concern entered the Bahamas likely sometime in early March. Further, the variants have rapidly come to dominate our COVID-19 infection in country. We already know from our previous data screening from the reference laboratory in Brazil, there was no evidence of variance in the sample up to November 2020. However, Mr. Speaker, we await the sequencing results of the samples we sent to CARFA in mid-March. These results will assist to confirm our proxy results from the PCR screen and give us more detailed information on which streams are present in the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, as it stands today, the National COVID-19 report for the Bahamas 
is as follows. On Tuesday, yesterday, the 20th of April, 2021, there were 68 newly confirmed cases of COVID-19. Up, Mr. Speaker, up from the nine cases reported on Monday the 19th of April. This brings the total number of confirmed cases in the Bahamas to 9,868. From our latest data, there are nine moderately ill COVID-19 patients hospitalized in the Grand Bahama healthcare system. There are no patients currently in intensive care in Grand Bahama. In New Prince, there are 18 hospitalized COVID-19 patients at doctor's hospital. 15 are moderately ill, and three are currently in the intensive care unit. There are six moderately ill COVID-19 patients being treated at the South Beach Acute Care and Referral Center. At Princess Margaret Hospital, there are 18 moderately ill patients with COVID-19. There are no patients in the ICU at PMH at this time. In all, Mr. Speaker, there are 464 active cases of COVID-19 in the Bahamas. 81 persons have been recently classified as recovered from COVID-19. And this brings the total number of recoveries in country to 9,140 for a recovery rate of 93.6%. Fortunately, Mr. Speaker, there were no deaths confirmed yesterday. The total number of confirmed COVID-19 deaths, as previously stated now, stands at 194. Mr. Speaker, 26 deaths remain under investigation. Mr. Speaker, one COVID-19 death to us in the Ministry of Health, as I have said previously, is still one too many. We continue to pray for the families in the Bahamas who have lost loved ones to this persistent plague. This unrelenting COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker, the Lord knows I pray and I pray it comes to an end very, very, very soon for my people. Mr. Speaker, a total of 83,000, this is the leader of the opposition, a total of 83,288 RT-PCR tests have been carried out for COVID-19 in country. 575 tests were performed just yesterday with 68 positive and 494 negative. 13 of those tests were repeats to determine recoveries. There were no inconclusive test results of note. Mr. Speaker, unknown case location designation has been significantly decreased from a high of 382, now down to just 35, due to, due to a data cleaning exercise recently completed and reported yesterday. Mr. Speaker, we continue to progress. Mr. Speaker, Please let it be known to all on Sunday that as, that as we were able, and I want to say it again, Mr. Speaker, please let it be known to all on Sunday that as we were able to deploy an effective strategy, this administration, able to deploy an effective strategy of testing, tracing, isolation, and treatment to gain control of our circumstance and get us to that steady state after the second wave, we are poised, positioned, prepared, and executing that strategy to do the same with this increase. Mr. Speaker, regarding the COVID-19 testing capacity, we have established robust in-country testing platforms 
across the public and private sector. The National Reference Laboratory conducts RT-PCR COVID-19 testing and is optimizing all of its reagents and testing supplies. At the Princess Margaret Hospital, there are multiple technology testing platforms. We have the Gene Expert machine, we have the Panther machine, and the newly donated BioFire COVID-19 RT-PCR testing equipment that was donated to us from the United States. In Grand Bahama Health Services, we have the Gene Expert machine for RT-PCR tests. Mr. Speaker, the private sector capacity has also been significantly augmented since the first and second wave for both RT-PCR and rapid antigen testing. Mr. Speaker, in the Bahamas, we have in a month some approximately nearly 70,000 from RTP of uh, rapid antigen tests taking place within the country. Mr. Speaker, in regards to our quarantine isolation sites, we have reinstated our contractual agreement with the facility, and the facility is currently functional and functioning. Mr. Speaker, we have adequate in-country bed capacity. The Ministry of Health, government, stands ready to cope with the COVID-19 hospitalization in country. Having, having expanded our bed capacity significantly during our second wave experience. Doctor's hospital system, in doctor's hospital system, we have 25 beds at doctor's hospital rest. There's an additional three beds at doctor's hospital east and one IC unit there. The Princess Margaret has eight beds in the legacy isolation unit, 30 beds at the special pathogens unit, and the private ward at PMH can be expanded for additional space to house COVID-19 patients. On Grand Bahama, currently, there are a total of 23 beds available for COVID-19 patients. 16 beds at the Cancer Association of the Bahamas, and seven beds at the Infectious Disease Center. South Beach Acute Care and Referral Center has, ten, has a 10 bed capacity with a flexible expansion that can accommodate another 16 beds. Mr. Speaker, in regards to our personal protective equipment supply, and the questions there too. I want to inform the public that the Supplies Management Agency is fully stocked to cover masks, gloves, gowns, shoe covers, and full overalls, etc., as well as additional equipment and supplies for a sustained response by the Ministry of Health while protecting our healthcare workers. Mr. Speaker, in spite of readiness, however, in spite of all of this readiness, as the Prime Minister also would have reiterated earlier, we must continue to adhere to the public health precautions to break the chains of transmission of the virus. Mr. Speaker, we can ill afford an exponential increase in the number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalization in our country. Mr. Speaker, ongoing surveillance and monitoring has and continues to be essential in our COVID-19 response. Increasing cases results in increasing contact. Lessons learned from the second wave has informed early recognition of the need to ramp up early. Augmenting contact tracing is well on the way. Train agents from the National Health Insurance Agency have been reinstated as of Monday the 19th, 2021. These agents joined already reinstated agents from the Ministry of Education, Treasury, and other agencies of the government. 
Further augmentation is anticipated, drawing from the pool of over 100 trained agents that we utilize in the second wave and newly trained, ready to hire agents. Mr. Speaker, the engine of our response to COVID-19 relies heavily on our healthcare work. As we continue to augment our response, more and more is required of our healthcare workforce. But Mr. Speaker, we do have a challenge. Our nursing personnel is depleting. Mr. Speaker, we are losing many of them to hospitals in the United States. We are treating them as best that we can. We are treating them there. But it's hard, it's hard to compete. It's hard to compete when someone is offered close to $100,000 for a job, okay? It's hard to compete. The member for Angliston is aware. I take this opportunity to make a clarion call to all nurses. I take this opportunity to make a clarion call to all nurses in the community to come forward to assist. We need your help and we have appreciated your help and will continue to do so. Mr. Speaker, protocols and policies alone cannot get us out of this. I want to say it again. Protocols and policy alone cannot get us out of this. It is what you and I practice from day to day that will. I would like to remind the Bahamian public that the virus travels with people. And as we, and as we continue to adhere to public health measures and emergency orders, we decrease opportunity for the virus to spread. We in the Ministry of Health, and as the Prime Minister did earlier, we now renew our earlier plea for Bahamians to continue to wear your mask, sanitize hands frequently, avoid large gatherings, and adhere to physical distancing when out and about. Mr. Speaker, we reiterate the proven strategy the combat COVID-19 pandemic is adhering to the public health measures, testing, isolation, trace, and treat. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, vaccination is a critical element in controlling the spread of COVID-19 and bringing an end to this pandemic. And as we all know, Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 vaccinations are now available in country. Mr. Speaker, the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine in the Bahamas has begun on the 14th of March. And since then, Mr. Speaker, we have vaccinated 21,907 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been administered at vaccination sites and by the mobile units across New Providence, Grand Bahama, Elutra, and Abaco. Some 16,934 doses have been administered on New Providence, with 3,512 doses on Grand Bahama, 832 on Abaco, and 638 on Elutra. During the seven days, of vaccine distribution from the 9th to the 16th of April, the team administered some 9,546 doses of COVID-19 vaccine for an average of 1,364 doses per day. This week, Mr. Speaker, more than 4,000 appointments are offered to the public via the vax.gov.bs portal. Appointments are available at the Kendall G. L. Isaac National Gymna Gymnasium, the Lyahola Hall, Pilgrim Baptist Church, Church of God of Prophecy, and 
St. Anselm's Church starting Thursday. Most sites are open at 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. The Kendall G. L. Isaac gym site is open from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Vaccination centers were initially operating Monday to Saturday. But as we have expanded the sites, Mr. Speaker, the schedule has changed to Monday to Friday. Mobile units are also being used to reach resident facilities and the, home, the, the homebound with physical disabilities. Mr. Speaker, so far, the Bahamas has received a total of 53,600 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. 12,000 doses was a gift from the government of India, and 33,000 600 doses were received through the COVAX facility with the assistance of the Pan-American Health Organization. Continuing with PAHO, the Bahamas is scheduled to receive an additional 67,200 vaccines through the COVAX facility. We are pleased to report that the Bahamas has been informed by PAHO that it will receive the second tranche of AstraZeneca vaccine through the COVAX facility before the end of May. Mr. Speaker, finally, preparations are underway for the rollout of the vaccine program in all of our family islands, as was stated by the Prime Minister and Dr. Dal Regis yesterday. Mr. Speaker, I do want to remind the public that while there are vaccines are being rolled out in the family island, that vaccination centers on New Providence and Grand Bahama will remain open during the family island rollout as they have been. Mr. Speaker, the AstraZeneca vaccine, as we know, is a two-dose regimen. The administration and I want to say it again and reiterate this point, Mr. Speaker. The administration of the second dose of this vaccine will begin on the 10th of May, a very momentous day for us in this country. Currently, vaccinations are open to the following persons at this time in New Providence and Grand Bahama. The Prime Minister, Dr. Dal Regis, would have already spoken to the requirements in the family islands for vaccinating everyone above the age of 18. But in New Providence and Grand Bahama, it is open to healthcare workers, persons 50 years of age and older, persons with disabilities, uniform branches, the Royal Bahamas Police Force, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, the Bahamas Departments of Corrections, Customs, Immigration, and the COVID-19 Ambassador. It is open to teachers and staff of schools, homebound and physically challenged residents, individuals, student and athletes studying or competing abroad, coaches and other support, and hospitality workers, hotel and resort employees, public transportation workers, Linden Pinling International Airport workers, Nassau Airport Development Company, Nassau Cruise port workers, the straw market port, the straw market port and beach vendors, and tour operators. It is open to restaurant and retail workers, members of the clergy, and to accredited media editors, reporters, anchors, photographers, and videographers. Mr. Speaker, this list is continually being updated and expanded by the National Consultative Committee and others will soon and very soon be added to the list. I take the opportunity in this house to encourage, the Prime Minister also did earlier, every Bahamian to take the vaccine at the earliest opportunity 
when it becomes available for your group or subset of our population. Mr. Speaker, on another note, on another note, it is remarkable how persons find an opportunity to take advantage of the difficult circumstance that some of us find ourselves in. Police reports reveal that a 34-year-old woman was arraigned yesterday in the magistrate's court a few days ago on 80 counts of forgery and 80 counts of possession of a forged document. The woman was arraigned in connection with the recent trend in fraudulent COVID test results. We urge the public who are aware of such fraudulent test programs to report these, action, these actions, incidents to the police as these fraudulent activities, Mr. Speaker, can cause lives and lead to irrevocable damage to our economic life. We also want to state, Mr. Speaker, that after folks would have received the second dose of the vaccine, that we're going to be on alert for vaccination cards. As the Prime Minister has said, that once you're fully vaccinated, so beginning from the 10th of May, folks will be able to travel throughout the family islands. And we know that some enterprising individuals may want to step forward and begin to try to offer fraudulent, fraudulent, vaccination card. The Prime Minister would have spoken to the issue of enforcement. We want to warn individuals not to proceed. The Ministry of Health wishes to advise that there's zero tolerance for such behavior and that those who persist will be prosecuted by the fullest extent of the law. The persons offering the forged document and the person receiving the same are both public health risks in the highest order to our society. As COVID-19 persons who are positive and acquire a fraudulent negative COVID-19 test result can spread COVID-19 throughout the community in seconds. Mr. Speaker, this will not be tolerated. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister would have spoken earlier. There has been a more lax observant of the healthcare protocols by many of us here in country. However, Mr. Speaker, we do owe the Bahamian public a debt of gratitude for continually adhering to the preventative measures during the first and second wave. It is because of their discipline we once brought down escalating COVID-19 cases to zero in the first wave and near zero in the second wave. We must remain steadfast to see those results again. Therefore, let us all remain vigilant and continue to demonstrate responsible behavior. Mr. Speaker, it is true no one has, was ever prepared for a disruption of life as we now know it. Yes, the pandemic has pushed us into maintaining social distancing to isolate ourselves from COVID-19. More than ever, we must remain connected via the internet to keep our activities afloat. It is challenging, but Sandeep Ralhan of Walmart Labs said, there is an amazing opportunity to unlearn, relearn, and test our capabilities and value systems. With this in mind, my fellow Bahamians, as the Apostle Paul said, we must continue to endure as good soldiers. The Apostle Paul further went on to say in another place, we must continue to endure, for in due season we will reap a reward if we faint not. And Mr. Speaker, we must remain focused as a people, and we will remain focused, to collectively bring COVID-19 to an end in the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, may the Lord of life our God bless you and continue to keep you. And may he bless and keep your family and the family of all Bahamians. And may God Almighty continue to bless and keep this great commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member.
uh, ordered that the communication be brought up. Ordered that the document will lie on the table. The chair recognizes the honorable member for.